Hello, Bezel Triple Three. That was Robert Morris, pastor of Gateway Church in South Lake, Texas, whose motto is, we're all about people. Weighing in at over 200,000 square feet, this supersized structural behemoth is the result of an $86 million investment from its apparently quite affluent membership. Complete with a 4,000-seat auditorium, bookstore, coffee bar, and children's amusement park, Gateway boasts an average weekly attendance of 16,000. I listened to one of Robert's sermons recently and was not entirely surprised that it was about money. Robert can say what he wants about his church doing so well financially, but let me tell you, for this kind of enterprise to continue to function, the diameter of the financial pipeline better be really big and its monetary flow uninterrupted. This sermon is about, you guessed it, tithing. Now here's what he says, you have gone away from my ordinances, my, let me tell you what the word here, ordinance means, it means a principle of ordinary behavior. Now that's not entirely correct, an ordinance is not a principle, an ordinance is a statute or a law or a command, it was something the people of Israel were to do under the Mosaic law, and they were to do it without break and without variance. In terms of the tithe, people were to give a tenth of all their agricultural produce. There was the Levitical tithe, there was a festival tithe, and, the, and there was a, a tithe, and there was a tithe for the poor. And these tithes would go to the Levites, who would then give a tithe, a, a tenth of what they were given, to the priests. Tithing is a test. Every time you get paid, are you going to believe that God's word works, that 90% with God's blessing goes farther than 100% without, it is a test of your faith. Now, did you catch what he said? God's word works? That, my friends, is not the gospel. That is called pragmatism. He is really saying that Christians should tithe because it gets results. <laughs> he said 90% with God's blessing goes farther than 100% without his blessing. Is that why Christians are to give of their financial resources? I don't think so. That is a very self-centered motivation. But I guess it's consistent with a church that has a motto like, we're all about people. It's the, also the only place in the Bible that says we can test God. God says, test me. Test me and see if I will not be faithful. It, it, it is a money-back guarantee. Ah, that's right. Malachi 3 is all about a money-back guarantee. My friends, the language here is geared towards upper-middle-class American consumerism. People who are used to being told, if you're not fully satisfied with the product, you may return it for a full refund or exchange. Shipping and handling charges are not refundable. Here's number two. Tithing is biblical. Yes, tithing is biblical insofar as it is found in the Bible. But is it a continuing command for New Covenant Christians today? Robert now is going to try to make the case that tithing was going on before the Mosaic Law. Uh, well, first of all, you need to understand tithing was way before the law, and it was after the law as well. And it's an ordinary principle in God's Word. Okay, like I said before, tithing is not an ordinary principle found in God's Word, and it is not a command or a continuing system found before the Mosaic Law. Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that's Abraham, gave him, that's Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Now let me just say something. Listen, listen, think about this too. This is about 500 years before the law. Okay, you might want to grab your Bible here. In Genesis 13, Abram builds an altar to God in response to God's gracious promises to him. No tithe is mentioned there. In Genesis 14, Abram rescues Lot by defeating the kings who took control of Sodom. He brings back all the booty or the spoils from the battle. We see then that Abraham received a blessing from this mysterious figure named Melchizedek. We're told that Abram gave him a tenth of everything, a tenth of the booty. 
From all appearances, this seems to be a one-time event rather than a system or a standing command of God for his worship. And even if this were the beginning of a system of tithing, then to whom did Abram give a tenth to from then on? Melchizedek disappears from the scene, and there is not yet any priest to give a tithe to. It's interesting, too, that in Numbers 31, a command to set apart one five-hundredth of the spoils from a victory to give to the priest as an offering is found there. But that's much different from a 10% tithe. So I find that using Abram as an example of a person tithing is just not being completely honest. I say this because there is simply no command or ordinance to systematically tithe before the Mosaic Law. There are examples of giving, but every one of them is voluntary, not compulsory. And just a side note, circumcision was commanded before the Mosaic Law and found within the Mosaic Law. So if one is following the logic here of Richard, why isn't he promoting circumcision as well? Okay, now, Richard is going to try to show that Jesus taught tithing. Let's see what he has to say. Matthew 23, 23. Very easy to remember. 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, 10%, of mint and anise and cumin. These are spices that you put on your food. And you even tithe on the spices you put on your food and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Watch, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, we don't need to spend a lot of time here. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He's right in the middle of pronouncing woes on them. A woe is a a malediction or a warning of bad things to come. It is within this context that Jesus mentions tithing. The focus of this passage is not tithing, but rather the scribes and Pharisees' obsession with obeying the minute letter of the law while neglecting the things God really cares about. If Richard wants to use a New Testament text that actually teaches tithing, he's going to need to go somewhere else. Here, mortal men receive tithes. This is New Testament. But there, watch this. Capital H, he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. This is absolutely amazing to me. I put my tithe in the box, mortal men take it out, but there he receives my tithe. Jesus himself receives my tithe. That's Hebrews. That's New Testament. Well, doggone, he does try to go somewhere else. Hebrews 7. But do we find tithing being taught there? Well, no, we don't. The purpose of Hebrews 7 is to point to the fact that just like Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and the priests, Jesus likewise, being in the order of Melchizedek, is greater than the entire Levitical priesthood. As we read in chapter 8 of Hebrews, Christ has obtained a much more excellent ministry and the covenant he mediates is better because it's based on better promises. Sorry Richard, no tithing there. Now, Richard is going to use shame tactics to scold those in his congregation who are not tithing. Listen to what he says. And I'm not simply talking about my messages, but all the equipping classes, all the kairos, all the freedom, all the counseling, all the all the things. Someone's paying for the priests to devote themselves to the Word of God. Someone's paying for that. Now, I have a question for you. Would any of you here go to a nice restaurant, eat a meal, and skip out on the check. Any of you? Any of you not pay? Okay, listen, some of you do it every week. (laughs) Is this okay for me to talk like this? (laughs) No, it's really not okay, Richard. It's called manipulation, and it's not preaching at all. What you're really saying, Richard, is that if you want to partake in the church's services provided by the priests, so much for the priesthood of all believers, then you'd better kick in your tithe. The problem with the, the meal analogy is that it's pure law with no gospel. To dine and dash at a restaurant where payment is required and to attend a Christian church where perhaps a person has not yet come to know the goodness of God and his gospel and is not yet able to respond to the gospel in gratitude is not, I repeat, is not the same thing. It is rather a country club with required dues. Please remember God doesn't change. God said, you're robbing me, 
and you're under a curse. I don't want you to be under the curse. I would like to open the windows of heaven over you and bless you. And I'd like to rebuke Satan from stealing from you. But that'll be up to you whether I do that or not. God does not change. He's always been opposed to false teachers and always will be. The words of Malachi were to a specific people at a specific time. The robbing of God in context refers to people withholding some of the Levitical tithes of animals, land, fruit, and other stuffs. The phrase, test me now in this, certainly refers to the present circumstance and not a universal invitation for Christians throughout the centuries. If you are a Christian, neither you nor your finances are cursed, and there is no money-back guarantee that if you will tithe, then God will bless your finances. That's nowhere found in Scripture. Richard is making this stuff up, a very dangerous thing to do. I promise you, I promise you, doing it God's way works. Yeah, forget financial planning and responsibility. Just tithe, and God will have to bless you. It just works. Here's what non-tithers say. I can't afford to tithe. It's because you're under a curse. Can I tell you something? You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because tithing is what breaks the curse. Tithing is what breaks the curse? I thought the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is what breaks the curse. Try it. I'll give you your money back. I've been saying that for 11 years. I've never had to do it one time because it's based on the Bible. Man, can you believe this guy? He is preaching a theology of tithing rather than a theology of the cross of Jesus Christ. But then a church with a budget as big as gateways, I guess you've got to be constantly placing the carrot in front of the people's noses to get them to give and give and give. He's given you what you get. He can give you more. He can also take what he's given you and give it to someone else who will steward it better. And if you don't think that's scriptural, read the parable of the talents, because that's exactly what he did. Ah, yes. And then he ends up the sermon with a threat. Wow, why do so many people put up with this garbage? Okay, here's the kicker, spoken by one of Richard's lesser priests. You know, many people think tithing is about giving to the church. I hope you know, if you go to Gateway, you'll know uh, we don't even pass the plates here. This isn't about the church. It's about a test of our heart. Oh, really? Well, how about the donation box as you walk into the auditorium? Or how about the online giving page on your website? How about those things? Okay, so do I think tithing is biblical? Well, yes, we find it as a command in the Old Testament. Now, are Christians required to tithe in the New Covenant? Well, I believe no. However, Christians are called to give sacrificially of all their resources, including their money, in gratitude for what God has given them, namely new life in Christ and all his benefits. Our giving should be done gladly, lovingly, cheerfully, voluntarily, and proportionally to what God has blessed us with. 10% is perhaps for a lot of us only a starting place. But to give in order to receive a blessing? No, we give because we have already received all things in Jesus Christ.